All right, Matthew chapter 16, look at verse number 13. When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What a statement. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. Look at verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now we're going to get to the rest of those verses during a different message, but I want you to go back to this question. Jesus asked a question. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who, who, are, who are they talking about? Who do they say that I am? Now, I want you to think this morning, I'm going to do my very best to convey a, a, a kind of a confusing thought that I'm just trying my best to wrap my head around, and I'm going to do my very best to share that thought with you, and hopefully you can wrap your head around it and whenever by the time we're done. I'm going to do my best. Be patient with me if I, I don't do the very best at it. But he asked this question. Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? The people around you, who, 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 what are they saying? You're, you're out there. You hear them. What do they say? Who do they say that I am? Now, I want you to remember, Jesus is God. Jesus, the Son of God also, which we're going to see here. Jesus has, uh, has existed from, from eternity past. He'll exist into eternity future. We understand that from the rest of scriptures. Jesus already knew what everybody was saying about him. He said, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who do they say I am? But he already knew. Why would he ask his disciples, what are they saying about me, if he already knew? There's, there's examples in the Bible of, of the Pharisees talking among themselves quietly, and Jesus knowing what they're saying or even knowing what they're thinking. He already knew. He must have wanted the disciples to think about it. They may not have thought about it before. Uh, they may have been enjoying the experience without considering the immense impact of what was happening. They're following Jesus. They're seeing amazing miracles. But have they really thought about who he was? Jesus knew the answer. Jesus knew what people were saying. But he asked them, what do men or who do men say that I am? The disciples didn't know that people from every continent would know their names and their stories. They didn't understand the hugeness of what was going on. They didn't know that they were living at the turning point of all history. They didn't know that eventually they, they would understand more of that. But at this point, they didn't know that they were following the only human being who would bring himself back from the dead. They didn't understand all of this was happening. They were following him. They saw the miracles. They, they saw some amazing things beyond what you and I have ever seen. But had they stopped and thought, who is this man? Maybe they had. But Jesus asked, what do men say or who do men say that I am? Now, you may be kind of like the disciples this morning. This is going to be a long introduction before we get to the message, so, so hang in there. But, but think, think with me. You might be enjoying the experience of being a Christian in America without really considering how amazing it is. Here's the disciples following Jesus. He's called himself the Son of Man. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. He, he is, for, for as, as much as anybody could see, he's a man. He's got parents, as far as anybody knows. He's got parents who are Joseph and Mary. We understand that Joseph wasn't his real dad, that God the Father is his real dad. We understood that. But just to look at it, it looked like he grew up in a carpenter shop. He grew up in an area of Nazareth. He's just, he's just a, a man, and, and now people are, are following. We know he's not just a man, but this is just the way, the way it appeared. People are following him. The disciples are seeing him do some amazing miracles. But they may just not have stopped and thought about who is it that we're really following. And I want to challenge you this morning before we get into the message. If you're a born-again Christian, the blood of Jesus Christ has covered your sins. Following Jesus is a bigger thing than you may have realized or thought about for a while. According to John chapter 3, verse 15, you will never perish and you have eternal life. 
According to John 3, 18, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you can never be condemned for your sin. Have you stopped and thought about that recently? Jesus said, whom do men say that I am? This next question is going to be even more, who do you say that I am? And getting the disciples just to really stop and think, and that's what I want you to do this morning, could you just stop and think, if I have trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, I will never perish. The blood of Jesus Christ has covered my sins. I have eternal life. I can never be condemned for my sin. The Holy Spirit of God lives in you. What an amazing thought. You may not have even thought about that recently. God lives in you. He calls you the temple of the Holy Ghost. He lives in you to convict you, to con to con to comfort you, to teach you, to guide you. Have you stopped lately to think about how big of a deal it is to be a Christian? Here's the disciples are following Jesus, and he stops there. There's Caesarea Philippi. He stops. He, he turns around. He looks at him. He says, who, who do people say that I am? Who are people, what, are, what are people saying? Being a Christian is a really big deal. I know we're here on Sunday, and it's kind of just a routine. We go through the routine, but I kind of want to shake you out of that this morning. I kind of want to help get you out of the, hey, we're coming to church just because we're Americans, you're supposed to go to church, right? We're, all right, my, my, my parents go to church, my parents maybe go to church. It's really huge. Have you ever had a spiritual aha moment? Have you ever had one of those? My wife, and were talk, my wife and I were talking about those this, this week. When the spiritual light bulb above your head blinks on, you know, you don't talk about in the cartoons when the light bulb turns on when somebody has that idea and that way you know that they had an idea in the cartoon. Have you ever had one of those spiritual light bulbs turn on when you realize something really big from the Word of God? Maybe this. Maybe the moment you realize that the Bible that you hold in your hand is the very word or words of God. The very words of God. God Himself gave us these words that are in this. Have you stopped and thought about that? Did, did you? Can you think back to the time when you realized that for the very first time? You thought, oh, wow, wow. God gave us His words. The very words. Yes, yes, it's the love letter from God, but it, it's so much more than that. The words of God, all that, all that He wants us to know, right here in this book. Did you ever have that moment? You're looking at me like you're half asleep here this morning. Help me out. Did you, did, did you ever, if you, had, if you helped in the car wash yesterday, you have an excuse. All right, go to sleep. Everybody else, you got to stay awake. All right. That, that moment where you look at the scriptures and you say, wow, these are not just words. These are God's words. The one who created everything by saying, let there be light. And God said, and it was so. The words of God. Every word that I read out of this book, it was inspired by God himself. Have you ever had, maybe this is your moment, have you ever had that moment where you say, whoa, that means that every single word written in my Bible, God, that, that was said by God, the word inspired means God breathed. God said that, whoa, bing, light bulb, turn on in my head. That is amazing. Spiritual aha moment. Maybe the moment you realized that the Bible actually spoke to the real issues of life. For me, I was a teenager, and it was Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. The Bible says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. And for the first time in my life, it clicked with me. The Bible is telling me something that makes a difference in my life. If somebody's mad and, and I can give a soft answer, that changes a lot. A soft answer. That, that was, there's so many principles in the Bible. That was the one for me that clicked with me. I thought, Wow, the Bible really can help. Maybe your aha moment came when God answered you when you prayed. Have you ever had one of those? and you, you were praying about something and God answered it. God came through for you. And now it's not just religion. Now it's not just going to church on Sundays. But you talked to God. God heard you. And he actually answered. Whoa. Oh, wow. Aha. Bing. Right? For me, I was 12 years old, riding my bike to soccer practice, the terrible man-eating dog was chasing me. He was going to eat me, I'm sure. I remember praying, and God made that dog step on a thorn, however it happened. The dog, dog stopped chasing me. I made it to soccer practice alive, and I thought, God just answered my prayer. An aha moment. Now, maybe you have him. If you're a born-again Christian, you got to realize something. The blood of Jesus Christ 
has covered your sin, paid the price for your sin. Uh, He's accepted you as you are. He's made a place for you in heaven. He answers your prayer. He's given you the very words of God. Wow! And I want you, not not like the disciples who, I don't know what they were thinking. I'm I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. But I don't know if they were thinking, we are following God in the flesh. God in the flesh. The man, the man that is in front of us walking down this trail is not just a man. This is, this is God. That's where we need to be. Whoa. The, the one that we came to worship and praise and serve and sing about and learn about this morning, he is God. Okay, so hopefully you're, you're, you're getting that. Jesus already knew what people were saying about him. But with his question, he got his disciples to stop and think what a big deal it was to be following him. If you're a Christian, it's a big deal. If you're living in the United States of America as a Christian, you may be enjoying the benefits without appreciating them. And I just want to stop and remind you this morning. Do you appreciate your freedom of religion? Now, I know that's not exactly what this passage was about, but if that got the disciples to stop and think just a little bit, can I get you just to stop and think a little bit? Do you appreciate that you can believe whatever you want to? You can read the Bible whenever and wherever you want to. Do you appreciate your freedom of speech? You can tell anybody you want to about Jesus. Now, we're in danger of losing this freedom if we don't use it more. If we don't tell more people about Jesus, there's going to be less people saved. We're going to lose this freedom. Do you appreciate it? Do you appreciate it enough to use it? To, to actually not just say we have a freedom of speech and get upset if somebody one day stops somebody else from saying what they want to say, but actually using your freedom. You've got a freedom of speech. You can tell people about Jesus. Do you appreciate your freedom to educate your children according to your values? Well, we, we miss this sometimes. We're, we're, we live in this amazing country, and you can choose a public school, a private school, a church school, or even a home school. The amazing thing is that the choice is yours. There's no excuse for having people teach your children who you don't want teaching your children. You live in a country where you can choose to educate your children how you want to. Have you, have you stopped and thought about that just for a moment? Do you appreciate your wealth beyond what most of the world understands? You might say, Pastor, I'm not wealthy. Tell that to somebody from Venezuela this morning. Tell that to somebody from anywhere around the world this morning. Do do you appreciate that, what God has given you? And and I just want you to stop this morning. The the disciples were following Jesus. He turns around, looks at them and said, who do men say that I am? And they just had to stop and think. What what are they saying? And then the the disciples answered Jesus' question. And and they answered with, with, with well, they're they're saying that you might be John the Baptist or Jeremiah or or maybe Elijah the prophet. The people who had met Jesus or heard about Jesus were comparing him to some amazing people. Jesus turned around and asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? His disciples said, well, well, a master, some are saying that you're John the Baptist. Herod thought he was John the Baptist come to life. Remember, Herod had killed John the Baptist. And the Bible even says that Herod thought, Jesus, he's doing these miracles. John the Baptist has come back to life. I cut his head off, but he's come back to life. And he is scared, Herod. They thought Jesus may have been John the Baptist. Some of them said, well, it was, he's, he's Jeremiah, come back. He's Elijah, come back. Now, if anybody accidentally mistook you for John the Baptist, men, would, would you be upset? No, I, I take that as a compliment. That's a pretty good comparison. Pastor Reyes, your preaching reminds me of John the Baptist. Yeah, I'd let you come back to church here. Absolutely. That's never happened, but, but I take it as a compliment. But for Jesus, it wasn't a compliment. Do you understand that? Jesus said, who do men say that I am? Well, well, Master, they're saying you're like some pretty great people. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah. Those are some great names. Understand this. Those are great names and, and amazing followers of Christ. But for Jesus, that wasn't a compliment. And Jesus asks another question. Whom do or whom say ye that I am? Then they really start thinking. The last answer was easy because you could tell them what somebody else was saying. Jesus turned and looked at the disciples and said, okay, so everybody else is saying I'm I'm these things, but what do you say? Who do you believe, Jesus is asking, who do you believe that I am? Now, Peter answered that question really, really well. Jesus already knew what other people were saying about him. And Jesus already knew what the disciples thought about him. So did he ask because he wanted to know who the disciples thought he was? 
I don't think so. Or did he ask because he wanted to bring the disciples to a point of decision? Now, I can't tell you the reason behind it, but I think that might be what it was. He already knew that Peter thought he was the Son of God. That's what Peter said. So why ask? I really believe that as he turns around, he looks at his disciples, he says, who do you say that I am? Now he's bringing each one of the disciples to the point where they have to make a decision. Who do I believe he is? He's a good man. He's a... He's an upright man. He's doing all these miracles. He's, a, he's an amazing man, but is that all? Peter clearly answered that he believed that Jesus was the son of the living God. I want you to, to see that verse again. It was in uh, verse number 16, Matthew 16, verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He must have believed it to say it. He either made a quick decision right there on the spot, or he had already been thinking about it for a while. Now think about this. Peter had seen Jesus heal people. He'd seen people cast out demons. He was, he was there when Jesus raised a 12-year-old girl from the dead. Okay, so we just said that like, okay, move on, next point. He raised a 12-year-old girl from the dead. I guess her age doesn't really matter. He raised a girl from the dead. He raised a person from the dead. Peter was there in the room. Everybody else had to leave. Peter, James, John, and uh, the parents were in there, and, and the girls lay him dead on, on this uh, a picture of bed. And, and Jesus says the words to her, daughter, I say to thee, arise. And she sits up. She's alive. Peter was there. He saw that. I don't know what it was that, that well, actually I do because I'm getting ahead of myself. But to, to, to look at Peter's life, you wouldn't know what it was that would, would make him say, well, you're the son of God. Maybe you're a prophet. I mean, Elisha, I think it was Elisha, brought somebody back to life. What was it that caused Peter to, to say, you are the son of the living God? We don't know what the rest of the disciples thought. What would you say if someone were to put you on the witness stand in a courtroom today? Tomorrow, today's Sunday. What would you, what would you say if somebody put you on the, on the stand in a courtroom and said to you, under penalty of perjury, who do you believe Jesus is? What would you say? Was he a good man? Was he a famous teacher? Was he a historical person of influence? I guess the question here today, who do you believe Jesus is? The answer to that question will determine where you spend eternity. This is big. I want you to understand just how big this is. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Who is Jesus? Who in your heart do you believe Jesus is? John 3, 16, you know this verse. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Now listen carefully to the rest of this. Don't quote it. Just listen. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What you think about Jesus determines everything about eternity. Now, I want you to stop and think about something. Look at verse number 17 with me. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. What's the word Bar-Jonah mean? If you've, if you've studied your Bible a little bit, you know, you know that means son of Jonah. Here's Jesus, after he had this discussion about being son of man and being the son of God, he looks at Simon, we call him Peter, and he says, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah. Jesus focused on the fact that Peter was the son of a specific man named Jonah. In the verse right before, Jesus had called himself the son of man. Jesus focused on the fact that he was part of the human race, which most people thought of an unnecessary distinction. I mean, if I get up and introduce you myself, hello, my name's Dave, I am a human. Most of you would think, okay, so let's move on to something we don't know. But that's what Jesus is saying. Peter, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So you've got him looking at Peter saying, Peter, or Simon, son of Jonah, specific man named Jonah, describing himself as part of the human race, he, it's it's. It seemed obvious that, that he was a human, so it seemed like you didn't even have to say that you're a son of man. But then Peter called Jesus the son of the living God. Somehow, Peter was able to see what most of the people were missing. The other disciples might have thought, 
How did you come to that conclusion, Peter? Jesus says, so disciples, who do you say that I am? And, and Simon Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I could just imagine one of the other disciples saying, how did you come to that conclusion? How did you get to that point? Maybe another disciple saying, I was thinking maybe that, but how do you know that? Peter, how, how do you know that for sure? Peter may have thought, how did I just come to that conclusion? And Jesus told Peter how it happened. Jesus, in verse 17, he lifted the curtain and, and let us peek behind the scenes for just a minute. In verse, chapter 16, verse 17, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. God showed Peter that this is Jesus, the Son of God, not just a man, not just a good man, not just a good teacher. This is the Son of God. Now think with me. I'm going to confuse your brain here. Ready? Scrambled eggs brain. Here we go. Peter, who was the son of a man named Jonah, declared that Jesus, who claimed he was the son of a man, was actually the son of God. Wow. Peter was the son of a man named Jonah, a real man. He was most likely a fisherman, and he lived in a house near the Sea of Galilee, is what we understand probably. That's where Peter was fishing at. Now, everybody who's ever been born had a father and a mother, and they are a son of man. You're a son of man. Now, the exceptions would be Adam and Eve. Obviously, they weren't born. They did have belly buttons. We know that. Because when God was done, he said, you're done and you're done, and poked them both right in the, in the belly. Okay, so that's not in the Bible. Adam and Eve, okay, so, so they, they, weren't, they didn't have a mother and a father. The other exception would be Jesus. He had a mother, a human mother, but not a human father. So why then did Jesus call himself the Son of Man? That title meant that he was a human. He's a person, a son of the human race. But it wouldn't be anything for any person to make that statement about themselves. You're a son of man, I'm a son of man. The phrase son of man means you're human. Ladies, just humor us on this, okay? You're a son of man as well. Just get used to it, it's fine. Us men have to get used to being the bride of Christ. You can be used to be called the Son of Man. You are human. Jesus introduced himself as, as human here. God addressed Ezekiel, the prophet, with the title Son of Man nearly a hundred times in that, that book of Ezekiel. The fact that Jesus used the title Son of Man to describe himself is a big deal because he was God for eternity before he became a Son of Man. He was introducing himself in a way that was fairly new for him to introduce himself. He is God, but now he says, I'm the son of man. I'm not just God, but now I am human. The four gospels are written, and the way they're written help us understand what it means for Jesus to be both God and man. I want, I want to, just a little bit of teaching. Hold on here. I want you to learn something. Matthew introduce, introduces Jesus as a king. Read through the book of Matthew. It, just read the lineage of the book of Matthew. It traces Christ's lineage from King David all the way to Jesus, and it shows us Jesus is a king. Some have said that if Israel had been a sovereign nation, Jesus would have been the rightful heir to the throne at the time. What a thought. Matthew introduces Jesus as, as a king. Mark introduces Jesus as a servant. There's no lineage of, of Jesus Christ in the book of Mark because a servant doesn't need one. No one cares where a servant came from, only that he's there serving. The book of Luke introduces Jesus as a man. Now, all of these Gospels are all about Jesus from different perspectives. Luke is a doctor, and it, the book of Luke traces Jesus' lineage back through men who were not kings. They were just men. And it traces Jesus' lineage all the way back to Adam, who was the first man. Jesus is a king. Jesus came as a servant. Jesus is a man. And then you get to the book of John, and Jesus is introduced in a completely different way. It doesn't say, this man begot this man that begat this man. It says in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It introduces Jesus Christ by the name Word. It's capitalized. It says, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In verse 14, the Bible says, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And we realize 
He's talking about Jesus. Jesus is not only a king because he's the son of a king. He's not only a servant. He's not only a man because he's, he's, a, he's a human, traces back to Adam. But he is God. The word became flesh. Jesus claimed to be the son of man, which he was. But Peter correctly identified him as the son of God. Now, there's an amazing moment in Peter's heart. The moment when he realized, this is big, I want you to get this. The son of man is also the Son of God. There was a moment that changed everything for him. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. Now, immediately after this conversation in Matthew chapter 16, when, when Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Immediately after that, in verse 21, the Bible says that from that time, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Once they realized this is God, then he started telling him, I'm going to die for your sins. They didn't get it at the time, but I don't want you to miss the magnitude of the reality that God came up. Listen to this. God came up with a way to physically die for us. By becoming a man. That way is Jesus. Jesus, the Son of Man, who is also the Son of God. So the question is, who is, who is Jesus? Well, there's all kinds of religions that will tell you different things about who Jesus is. But unless you realize that Jesus is God, you can't understand when He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to finish with this. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 5. Philippians 2, 5. Now, I know this has been a different kind of a message, and I just kind of want you to think this morning. I want you to, to be able to stop and realize, wow, this is really bigger than I may have thought that it is. I'm a Christian. I'm not just going to a church, not belonging to a church, but my sins are forgiven, my eternity is heaven. Wow. But here's what I want you to realize. You will have a moment when you admit that Jesus is God. Everyone will. Now, I'm, I'm almost done, so, so hang in there just a moment. That moment will come for you. There will be a time in your life when you admit out loud with your mouth that Jesus is God. You may not want to admit it now. You, you, you may, for, for whatever reason, you may want to say, no, I, I, I'm, I'm my own God. I, I, I do what I want to do. Or, or you just say, I don't really want to serve Jesus. I, I'm, gonna, I'm spiritual, but I'm not that kind of you know, spiritual. No, no, that, that doesn't work. There will be a moment where every person, you and me included, will Admit that Jesus is God. Now listen, if you don't do that while you're living this life, you will do that after this life is over, but at that point it will be too late to be saved. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse number 5. This is an amazing passage, and we're going to finish. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. Now listen to this, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You'll have that moment when you admit that Jesus is God. You will have that. If you have not yet in your heart admitted that Jesus is God and trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to do that. I would like to help you to do that. I'd like to show you how to do that. Somebody can show you how to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because that moment will happen for you. And if it doesn't happen while you're still living and breathing on this earth, it will happen 
after this life is over. The Bible says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. There will be a day when you will stand before God. And Philippians chapter 2, verse number 10 will come to pass, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We're done. Let me ask you this question. Who is Jesus? Who do you say that Jesus is? Now, I know I'm talking probably mostly to Christians this morning. And there's been a time in your life when you've realized you're a sinner, you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you know that Jesus is God. My goal this morning is to remind you, bring you back to that moment, maybe help you restore that relationship with your Savior that maybe you've kind of grown cold on. But this morning, if you've not trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I can't think of a better time to do that. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be in this place this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this challenge to stop and think. I, I know you, you asked the disciples, who, who do you say that I am? And Lord, I thank you that you've You've recorded that in your word so that we could read that and, and we can have that same question asked of us. Who do we say that Jesus is? And Lord, this morning, if there's one here that's not yet trusted you as their Savior, Lord, I pray that this morning they would realize Jesus is God. He died on the cross, paid the price for their sins, and he wants to give them a free gift of eternal life that they'd simply accept it. 